Okay, thank you and welcome to those of you continuing with your C1 Programming Plus certification. We're going to start off with an example system that is going to utilize our modular programming method for a relatively simple multi-zone video system. We just wanted to show um, a number of different factors as far as getting the latest modules off of the website, as far as following the zone connectivity, um, and all of those factors that we discussed. You're going to see a little bit of um, reminders of some of the uh, steps that we explained in earlier videos and also on the training page you'll have time stamping of all of the different subjects so that you can jump right into a specific subject on the timeline of this video if you need to review one topic versus reviewing it all. As we mentioned before, Compass Navigator is, or is one of the five software components. This is where you do your programming of your system. So your projects, your jobs, for your clients, for your showroom, etc. We open that up, we log in. Uh, that credential I just entered, of course, is C1 certified. Otherwise, you'd be in a read-only mode for our software in case you happen to come across the software without being certified. I will do a file new and begin a new project. I'm just going to go ahead and place it on our desktop here. We'll call this the modular class. Give it a name. You notice I use an underscore, which is a basic rule of thumb in programming, but actually you have to use underscores, no funky characters, no spaces in the project name and the iOS names because these are two things that actually interact with our cloud because projects get loaded to our cloud not to not directly into the iPad so think of it as a server if you will <clears throat> press OK enter the programming tab and then it's working from left to right from left to right like reading a book setting up controllers we're able to uh, add our iOS devices to today's system. We're just going to have an iPad. In fact, that reminds me, let's go ahead and introduce you to the system that we will be programming. So uh, here's the system that we will be programming. We will uh, have a two-zone matrix of ours, the multi-view, which actually allows you to break any screen into a video wall, if you will. So you can do quad screen and custom layouts, and all of this is actually built into the module we provide you. Uh, our four video sources are going to be a cable sat box, Apple TV, Blu-ray, and a laptop. We will have our Onkyo AV receiver complete with the uh, metadata of the module for the streaming music services. And we're going to have a flat screen television in the living room and a theater zone as well with our iOS device or even multiple iOS devices in there. So this is the system we'll program. You'll see us going into that to remind ourselves of, of everything in there. So again, it was entering Compass Navigator, creating a new project, and then entering program, set up controllers, or here I'm able now to choose my iOS, my iOS devices, our smartphone, smart tablet. I'll choose our iPad. We give it a name. We say this is my iPad. Again, I don't use any spaces or funky characters in the naming of an iOS device. Now, what is this? A device ID. You can see when you download our app and the registration you'll have this device ID. Now it is something that has to be manually generated. It's done very easily over a local area network and we now have firmware available for our master controllers that allow you to do it direct with the master controller instead of through the Compass Navigator software so that if you have a client who say since it's holiday season coming up here Christmas Day says hey we bought the kids iOS devices and we want to add Compass Control to it you can tell them just type in the IP address of the master controller in the Compass app and it will automatically create this ID which then gets married to 
the uh, Encompass Control license. So here's my uh, ID, 08AB, from my own iPad. So you see I've entered it in here. I add that controller, and I have an iPad. And it actually already has a look and a feel to it, doesn't it? Because the modular system has that defined look and feel. How about my master controller? We could use our MC1000, as we mentioned. We also have our first generation MC2500, or any of our HD Lite master controllers, which are matrix switchers with compass control built in. What is the IP address of that master controller, which is set through the device manager software, uh, master controller device manager. You just connect that to your master controller, connect the USB, set the IP address, and away we go. Show that in the C2 training videos. Adding my master controller in. If you have Lutrons in the HAI security automation product um, from Leviton, uh, the Lutron is imported by bringing in the XML file from that repeater, and the HAI is actually an automatic process where you just enter the IP address and the key information, and we collect that. So anyways, for our system, we just have the iPad and the master controller. Device ID generator, as I mentioned, uh, can be done over the local area network with the device. And although I, my device ID, or my iOS already has a device ID, I'll show you how that looks. I press here, device ID generator. What is the app version? We're now on version 1119. So of course it's 112 or later. And I'll just key this in to my iPad. I press a button that says generate ID. Type this in. Or in the case of doing it through the master controller, you could just type in the IP address of that device. Which brings us to adding modules again as we work from left to right. Adding modules are the devices that are in the system. Um, what did we have in our system? Well, we'll start with the simple IR devices. As you see, that's already selected. Local modules are the ones we provide you. We recall that we had an Apple TV. Apple, Apple TV. There's the functions there. Add that in. We had a cable sat, and here in the uh, States, DirecTV is very good. We also have a really nice DISH network um, uh, module. Of course, that's not IR, so we'll go with the DISH, but I will uh, show you where we download that from for an IP with full metadata. Um, we have a Blu-ray player. We'll say a Samsung. Type that in. Here we are. Here's the Blu-ray player icon. It says KD All Models, so it's a very generic code set because... Samsung has done a very nice thing, which is make their code sets very generic over the last few years. And we'll say that our television, if I return to the uh, system design and the, the television in the living room here, we'll say that is also Samsung, very popular here in the States. Okay. Uh, we also have our projector, JVC. Add that device in. Okay, so we have the projector and the television. We have Apple TV and the Blu-ray player. Now, other devices like our MLV and our amplifier and even the cable sat, although I don't have the lines indicating that, they're going to be IP controlled. And to choose IP, I could just come here into IP or RS-232 if it's RS. And we can come over to the, uh, the libraries we have here. Um, let's go to Dish, uh, excuse me, Dish, Hopper with the Sling, okay, we had the Onkyo, uh, KBTX1507, that's the four zone output, looks good, actually has, if I add that device in, there we are. It has a bi-directional driver there, so you can see this is the one with the uh, metadata. Now I wanted to show you our multi-view product, which actually has, if I go to keydigital.com, I'm going to show you where we post our newest drivers, if it's not yet in our software. We not only post drivers here and modules, but we also post 
integration notes. For example, here, Compass Control, bidirectional control modules, and I log in, my C1 certified credentials. I scroll on down to Key Digital, because here's this multi-view. Now, how, how do you know if something's not the latest, the greatest, well, uh, module that is? You know, if you look in the software and you say, you know, Key Digital sent me that email that said they had a new module for product X, but I don't see it in the software. Well, of course, our library updates when, as we update our software. So you'll say, oh, well, Jonathan or Key Digital told me they have the multi-view with the advanced um, module for that. I can download that file here. I'm going to go ahead and begin that. It's downloading the zip. I can also view the screens. Here's what the multi-view looks like if you break it into quadrant mode, or sources, etc. And then finally, or not finally, but we also have a video for each module. You can jump to YouTube or download the video. And very important, we also have a manual. This is a integration note, if you will. And a lot of the products are simply just entering the IP address of something if it is a IP controlled device. However, if you recall, our module is predefined, right? However, when we look at something like this image, we have these sources, laptop, cable, Apple TV, Blu-ray, well, that might be strikingly similar to what I have built for today to demonstrate to you. But how does our module know that these are the sources you have? So in some cases, you refer to the um, integration note. Where are we? And there we are. And you can see here, actually, Set up communication. MLV is controlled over IP on port 23. Please insert the IP address under the device properties. If you have more than one MLV, each one requires its own module. Also, you can see that the MLV 4x2 module can be customized to display desired icons and names for your sources. After adding the MLV 4x2 module into the project, Save the current project and open the MLV 4x2 module, which may be found in the resources folder of the current project, underscore RES folder. We'll show you how we do that. And then we could apply names by going to the variables tab and looking for our HDMI source icons and HDMI source names or VGA source names and icons as we do have VGA connectors on the MLV 4x2 as well. And if you want to choose an icon, there's a numerical assignment for everything. For example, the icon for the cable box is number three. So this is something I'm going to keep open as we do that. And I've now uh, downloaded that zip folder so let me, so let, of the latest module. So let me just cut that, bring it on over to my desktop, which is nice and clean right now. We will extract why are you jumping around on me, computer? Here we are. And it came in. It has the module. Um, all right, this is actually the module, the file that looks like a video, because apparently that was already taken, the .mod extension. Here's your IP commands. Here's some additional images you might need for that module. So I'm going to now bring in that device as a user module. So it's not a local, meaning one we supply you with. It's one that's saved elsewhere. Here it is. Add that device in. So we have our AV receiver, our matrix, multi-view matrix, the dish uh, set-top box with the hopper, which has just this brilliant, brilliant, um, metadata, uh, which I could actually show you. Here we are. Here's some pictures we could look at. Guide. You can see actually what it looks like in your iOS device. Okay. Very, very cool stuff, this dish network. 
We have our two screens, we have our iPad and our master controller, and that completes adding the modules, which is another word for the devices of your system. Of course, you always want to save your project. Save early, save often, it is a software after all. The next step is assigning zones. Now, I've told you that so much of the modular programming is automatic. Drag, drop, forget about it, right? How do we make things automatic? So that, for example, if I return to the slides I had shown you, where I press this DirecTV or Dish Network button, not only do I want to see the buttons to control that device, of course, I also want my screen in that zone to show me DirecTV, right? To show me that device I've selected. So everything is, 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 is based on a tree. What are the names of my zones? Here we have home or commercial. Now these icons are pretty much arbitrary at this moment. There's really no bearing on any graphic or anything. Um, we just come and we choose our zones, living room, and the home theater, which is right about here. It's all alphabetical. Now, actually, how this is done, uh, zone one of your system should be at the top of this list. Zone two at the bottom. So you kind of need to refer to your connectivity guide, don't you? Living room is our, oops, living room is our top uh, zone here, zone one. Theater is zone two. Here we are. I expand these zones. Living room only had video, but the home theater had video and audio. So this is a property of that zone as I change, uh, click my mouse to choose the different zones. Everything comes in with video as its selected activity there. So we have zone, we have activity. Now we have to build the tree for this, which is our next step as we move from left to right. Zone construction. The living room had our flat screen television, didn't it? And you see here it's called all model because that's the module that we brought in, wasn't it? But I could just give this a name that, uh, that makes sense to me. The living room, TV. Now I still see all model here, but if I click it, there we are, living room TV. And the living room TV was output one of our multi-view. So we, it's, it, building our tree is essentially working backward from the display. The display has its connections, what's connected to the display, our multi-view output number one connected on HDMI connection one or maybe two, three, or four. So again, you refer to your connectivity guides and if you're the programmer but you have somebody else installing, you need to communicate all of this based on your drawings. Source one into the system is Dish Network. Source two is our Apple TV. Source three is the Blu-ray player. What about source four? If you recall, that was a laptop. So in fact, when we have a device that needs a module, right, because we have to drag and drop it, but doesn't need a code set, what do we do? We actually, in the modules, we have something for that. We have a brand name called Empty, and in here we have a bunch of arbitrary devices that really just have a graphic and maybe a message, but no code set with it. So let's use our laptop connection, adding that device in, return to zone construction, where I now have that laptop, and I say that's source number four of the system. Living room only had video, so let me collapse that to see the rest of my tree, where the home theater has video and audio. And what we get to do here is, again, work backward. The projector is our screen for the video activity. Here's its discrete inputs, because again, when you press a button, it's really calling a discrete command, isn't it, to view that source. If you press Dish Network button, you know that the projector needs to be on the proper input, the AV receiver needs to be on the proper input, the matrix needs to be on the proper input, so the projector is actually, in this case, connected to our Onkyo, located here in the audio systems tab, output one, 
connect to HDMI one and it has all of its connections. So you see a new layer of our hierarchy established. What's the Onkyo connected to? Output two into the, we'll just say the cable sat input or whatever it may be called for that device. And you see we dragged our output two of our multi-view matrix and it retained the properties of that tree that we built in the living room, right? So it's the same matrix after all. Now let's say that in that home theater, sometimes I just want to listen to music. We can say that that's the output one here without needing the projector to turn on and switch to its proper input. And now we'd be able to view, because uh, we have that metadata, we'd be able to listen to the streaming radio, streaming music services without having to turn on the screen. And that concludes that. Auxiliary would be where any lighting controls show up. Um, security and thermostat as well. We save our project. We move now to controlling flow. Controlling flow is yet another tree that says, okay, now I know what commands I have to call, what discrete inputs I have to view and select as I, as I choose a source. Now, what if I want to choose an Apple TV and I want to control that Apple TV? What port of my master controller are those commands going to be executed through? So what we have here is just the project name. Think of the project name as your network to your system. Your master controller goes over first, which is a network-based device, and you see all of the ports it has. Let's say that we choose to control our living room TV on input one, our projector on input two, our Blu-ray on input three, and our Apple TV on input four. Now I don't have any RS-232 devices here, but what if I did? Simply right-click any port, choose the desired <coughs> property. Do you want it to be RS, sensor for voltage, or trigger of voltage? But the other devices are actually, well, outside of this laptop, which is just an empty device, doesn't matter. The other devices are all IP. Now, remember, as I mentioned, think of the program, the project, as a network. Any IP device just gets drug over to the project name. Because, remember, the brain is the iPad. The iPad is going to be the point of execution for commands when I control an IP-based device. It doesn't have to go through the master controller. The iPad also gets drug over into the project name. And how this looks is basically if I'm controlling that Apple TV, the iPad speaks to the master controller, executes ports out of uh, commands out of port four to control that Apple TV. However, if I'm controlling my matrix, which is IP controllable, it really has nothing to do with the master controller. And that's a huge benefit in compass control is the fact that the uh, you can essentially add as many IP devices as you'd like to your system without uh, utilizing any ports. So you can have 100, 200 IP devices and just have a single master controller. You always need a master controller with Compass, though, at least one. So that's control flow. What is flow test as we, again, move from left to right in the program ribbon? Um, flow test is basically just choosing any device and testing the commands if you'd like. If you have everything connected now, you have your wiring, you'd like to see what it looks like as the matrix output one switches to input three, or if you'd like to see what it looks like as you hit the menu button on the Apple TV and you have that IR emitter connected. Now there's a few things we also need to do here, which is if I were to control my multi-view, it would be over the network. How did I? How do I tell my system what is the IP address? So here we are. We'll start here. We'll pretend that our network is 192.168.1.1. We'll start with our master controller. I've made that 1.239. We'll use our MLV as local IP address 1.238. That's with the uh, 
LIP stands for local IP address, GIP is the global IP address. We'll say our Onkyo is 237, and we'll say our dish is 236. So make sure you have the IP addresses answered correctly if you wish to control things over IP. If you don't, it will not work. Now, the next step, compile project. This is actually where we create a file that is going to be loaded into the iPad as the, as the project gets moved over into the iPad. Now, I, I do it here, but there's actually a few tweaks I will make that will cause me to recompile things. Why? Because Remember, this is whatever you want to show, the iPad is the brain in this system, and whatever the iPad wants to show as it manifests in the iPad, we should take care of those things here. Starting with, we have our main page, we have a status page. Here's the module for the laptop. Here's a module for the Samsung television, except for it still says all model because that was the name of the module. So this is where, th this right here in Controller Designer, these are the names that the end user will see for devices. So instead of all model, which they wouldn't really know what that means, we could call it something like the living room TV. There's our projector, that's good. Maybe we want to call it theater projector though. Here it says Samsung BD, we probably want to call it Blu-ray, ATV, maybe be a little more verbose with that, call it Apple TV. Here's the multi-view, MLV 4x2, so we could call that HD distribution or video matrix. Here is what it looks like, uh, our advanced page. This can be visible or not visible, but you could do some really awesome things in there. I do recommend checking out our module video to find out more. Here's the Onkyo basic controls, but then we also have Onkyo player. This is where you have your music services, so I could even call that streaming or music stream. And here's the dish, which might be called dish or maybe just satellite would be fine. One L or two in satellite, I always forget. Save the project, recompile, because again, these are, this is something that will be brought into, or manifested in the iPad as it shows us. Now, here you notice our activities. Those will actually automatically filter itself. We'd only have video and audio in this, products, in this project's case. Light, shade, climate, all that will be gone. So that's actually it, okay? That is how we do our modular system. Except for there was the next step, which was, if you recall that multi-view product, if you take a look at that, it needs to be told what are the sources so that we can have that module populate and look correct. That's an example of customizing a module. So if I, again, look here, See, source one, source two, source three, source four. Oops, sorry. Right now it's just got an icon and, and some text. So in order to edit that, actually there's a brand new uh, feature we included in the latest Compass Navigator update. Um, but you could click that device and you could actually edit its module. It asks you, do you want to save where you are right now in your actual project? And here I'm now in a totally different look feel, which is my module editor. Here's what it looks like. And what did that integration note tell us? If you recall, it told us to go to the HDMI source names we'll do first. Input one, two, three, and four are our 
cable sat or whatever we want it to be called. So uh, satellite, we called it, Apple TV, Blu-ray, and laptop. And it was variables. And as the instructions tell us in the controller designer window, click the variables tabs, and we have here MLV by programmer. So these are the ones you want to mess with. HDMI source names. And it tells us in the properties to click the ellipses and to give these some default value. One was our satellite. Two was our Blu-ray. That's correct, although I previously spelled it with a capital R. Three was our Apple TV. And four is our laptop plug-in. Next, it says to go to this HDMI source icons variable and again click the ellipses here. What did we have? Cable sat, three, actually satellite box, let's just go with that, 11, we had our Blu-ray, two, we had our Apple TV, so 11, two, here we are, third gen Apple TV, 21. So it's 11, 2, 21, and then we have a laptop, which is 9. 11, 2, 21. Nine. Press OK. Save. And now I just need to hop back over into my actual project. Go and open. And come over to find that. So make sure we're doing KSP. So these are the two modes of Compass Navigator. We automatically hopped into module editor mode a moment ago, and KSP is Key Digital System Project. So choose that, KSP. Now I see that modular back blast program of ours. And now if I return us to the default look of the module or the video matrix. Now this doesn't really show here. It will populate in the iPad though. Remember the intelligence is in the iPad. So we've taken care of that. There's other things though. For example, sometimes you want your client to see the projector remote. Maybe you don't want them to see it. You always have the option by just choosing any of those modules and deselecting the property which says visible module page. Now you do notice it kind of does a weird thing, which is it just the properties window kind of changes. But if I click back on those devices, that has saved. So that's how you can make something invisible. So they never really, sometimes you want to give your client all the buttons, sometimes you don't. Or you could just edit that module and remove the buttons you don't want. All right. So now we've actually edited a module. There's another step, though, that is some, you know, necessary in some projects' cases, um, in others, perhaps not. We give you the ability to edit and build your macros, as you wish, in fact. And um, now this is uh, an additional layer of uh, the customization that's possible, even in our modular programming step, or method, where other drag-and-drop programming systems don't give you such flexibility, we do. Now it's not always the, uh, it's not the most direct thing as of this moment. In that variables tab, similar to the variables we had for the multi-view, right? All of the behind the scenes stuff that makes the modular system tick, it's all found in the menu bar. Why we call it the menu bar is because Basically, the modular system works by navigating through the menu you have on your iOS. You choose your activity, video, audio. If you pressed audio, for example, the next step is to choose your zone. And then when you choose your zone, well, only there's only one applicable zone, right? So it's a filter. If I chose video, I'd have two zones available. And then what you would see next is um, see video, two zones, audio, just a regular, just one zone. Here's all of my devices there. 
Now this filter actually has a lot of extra stuff in it that won't, you won't see on your iPad because again, when it loads into the iPad is when we really see the intelligence. But that's a third layer of filtration of our system. Activity, zone, device. Activity, zone, and devices. Activity, zone, and devices. Now, again, if this doesn't look like it's really populating well here, it doesn't really populate well in, until we put it in the iPad. But here in the menu bar, we have two variables we have to look at in order to customize this. Your macros, when you select an audio video device, it's the very last variable in that menu bar folder. So again, opening menu bar, scrolling down to the very bottom, S underscore device switch. This is where we can see what happens depending on what zone you're in, what activity, and what device you've selected. The zones, if you recall, are assigning zone and zone construction. I can actually view that by just clicking here, control connectivity tree, here's the other one, zone connectivity tree, and I can see that layout once again. And it, the zone numerical assignment is just top to bottom. Living room is one, home theater is two. So that covers the zone. What else? Activity. When I click these zones, do you remember when we chose video for living room or home theater, we chose audio? Do you notice that each activity has right beside it a numerical assignment? So activity one, video, activity two, audio. Finally, device. Now we have to go to one other variable in order to find out what is device seven, what is device five, six, eleven. And it's a little bit random how it assigns these, but it's the second menu. So from the uh, very bottom, device switch variable, the very last variable in the menu bar folder to the second from the top to our device name variable. Just like we did in our multi-view when we edited it, we go to our initial value, we go to our ellipses, and we can see here what every device in the system, what is the numerical assignment. I like to scroll down a little bit so I can see Apple TV 5, Blu-ray 6, Satellite 7, and where's our laptop 11, okay? So I like to scroll down, I can see all this, and I like to just take a print screen of that, or jot it down on a notepad in front of you, depending on how many devices you have. I go to Microsoft Paint, I paint that, or I paste that if I, so I can reference that. And our macros, by default, if I return now to device switch, if I'm in zone one, the living room, if I'm in the video activity, which is one, and I press device seven, which is seven, the satellite. See? What happens? What we give you by default is just switching. Just switching. Now, a lot of you guys might want it to do more than that. You might want it to power on via IR. Zone one is our living room. So I press so these are our events and actions. Let me just take a step back here. I could add, I just click where I want to insert something. Right below is where it's going to go, and I could add an event. IR, RS, IP, page jumps, delays. And I want to make sure the TV's on. So it says IR. What am I sending to device what? Because it's an IR event that I just added. It shows me all of my IR commands. Here's my living room TV, and I want to power it on. Now, when I'm in zone one, living room, and my activity is video, I always want to do that. So is it correct to put it only where here, where I say, if it's the Apple TV or the cable or the SAT, or should I duplicate control D or right click duplicate and put it everywhere? I like to save myself some time, effort by putting it here before I start asking about my device and I say, well, if I'm in the living room and I'm doing something with video, anytime I press a button, we need to power on that television. Okay. And if it's cable sat, your dish network is probably always awake. If it's number five, that's our Blu-ray player. We probably want to make sure that is on as well. Samsung Blu-ray, all models, power on. 
And you can drag this wherever you'd like. Maybe you want to put this first. Six is our Apple TV. Maybe you've gone ahead and set that thing to never go to sleep. Eleven is our laptop, which really doesn't go to sleep at all. Or, you know, it's no commands. Okay. I scroll down. If I'm in zone two and my activity is video, here's my projector. We make sure it's on the right source. I can also, I also though, want to make sure, so I right click duplicate, that this thing is on whenever the activity is one, video. Power on. Here's our activity two, because remember the home theater had audio as well. We could switch our MLV because that had all the sources going into it. We can, uh, if they wanted to, in case they just wanted to listen to Apple TV and they're doing some airplay or something, um, and, uh, or, and we select our source here. Okay. So this is zone two, our activity two, our audio. Now, and so that's how you edit your macros. It's all here in the device switch. Device switch, we reference that for our if statements of what is our zone, activity, and device we pressed, and what is in the menu bar, the other variable, device name, choosing the ellipses as a review to know what are our numerical assignments until we have our next update with ASCII-based names. And that leads us to our finishing touches. Your client might want you on their home page to insert a logo of their favorite sports teams or a family photo. We at Compass Control allow you to insert any PNG image. If you have a JPEG, most likely they're going to uh, be it's going to be a, uh, uh, not a PNG, or if you've gone and taken pictures of your client's house or office, it's most likely not going to be a PNG. It'd be a JPEG. You can just open it up and save it in paint. But we like PNG because it's nice and transparent. When I'm here in Google Chrome, that checkerboard is what indicates a transparent image. That's going to be transparent. I'm going to go ahead and save this image as. Just put it on my desktop or maybe you in the future. Create your own compass folder. So I have that logo saved to my desktop. And how do I bring this in? Well, you got to do a few things, or two things. You have to actually go to our image library. And we have, I like, you might have created your own uh, folder, which you would be able to view, or if you'd like to learn how we do that, it's a C3 video we have. I think C3 part one or C3 part two. We also have a, a folder called Module GUI. These are all the graphics we use in our modular programming that we actually give you all of them to, to work with in Compass Navigator. I choose that, and here's a library full of resources. Here's a bunch of panels, activities, sliders, iPod panels. You can see you can spend your own time to go through all of these. And I'm just going to add to back panels because I don't really care where it ends up going. I'm going to go ahead and uh, add that image in there. Now, actually, I'm not only going to add the New Jersey Devils logo in there, but I also downloaded earlier a, uh, a module, the MLV. And so hitting this double plus actually allows me to import all images from a specific folder. Single plus is just a single image, but I want to bring in all of these. Because anytime you download a new module from our website, you should also make sure you have all the images you're working with. So here's those MLV images. Here's my New Jersey Devils logo. And I can't really see it because it's just a small portion of that, right? Now, I have those images. I want to save my library. And the place you put an image is the status page. Status page. I go here. This is something that right now just kind of tells you what you're doing. In the future, we're toying around with maybe putting some more graphics in there of the zones you're in and that kind of thing. Plus, 
and bring in, oh, sorry, not plus. Uh, I'm going to just come over to that New Jersey Devils logo. I'm going to just drag and drop it on the page. Center it. And we actually give you a guide of where things are at centered uh, on the Compass FAQs page. That looks pretty good. And now if I'm in Satellite, Onkyo, Streamer, all of that, I don't see that logo. Only when I'm in the status page, which is something we actually time out to. One final macro and finishing touch you might want to deliver is, see, I've showed you these module pages. I actually can't come here to this living room TV and, and delete this button. I'd have to edit that module, okay? Modules can't be edited. What can be edited is the main page and as you just witnessed, the status page. What is on the main page actually are the kind of the shortcuts, our left navigation, where you have our activities, the zone device group. And the one you might want to mess with is your power panel. Because how this works actually is I press this power button here, it makes this power panel visible. Press it again, it goes away, or after 12 seconds, I think, it goes away as well. I could make that visible by selecting it, make its property, its initial property one. What I have in here are basically just a bunch of things we thought you might like, but you could change. Whole house, it says. Some people like that we have the on and off. Other people like that, or instead want to make it something like watch cable. Right? And maybe that doesn't really require one button, or two buttons, pardon me, on and off, but maybe just one. So I like to just not delete things, but make them invisible instead. Now I have no off button, it's essentially invisible. I can center this, I know that this panel is 128 wide, center point of that is 64, right? So power on, center, 64. Oops. Uh, not width, sorry. The X axis, there we are. Watch cable. And now, just like when we had our device select macro, what, what do I do when I press this here? Well, in zone one, which is our living room, I want to turn on the TV. I want to make sure that the matrix output one, so output, uh, well, let me choose the MLV four by two, output one, select source one, and, you know, the cable box is always on, or satellite, pardon me, I should rename that to satellite, watch, satellite, okay, um, but that's if I'm in zone one, if, if, how do you build an if statement? You saw them earlier. Here's how I added in this green arrow with the interruption, checking if, if what? Well, remember we had our variable called selected zone. So I choose parameter one, if equal, so if current, was it selected zone or current zone? I could refer back here to my device switch macro because we know that's the same one we want to use. If current zone, there we are. So let's return here. If the current zone equals one, and I press this button, power on living room, TV, make sure the matrix is on the proper input. What if I'm, I duplicate that, control D or right click duplicate. What if I'm in zone two? We don't want to power on the television. We want to power on our projector. And I'll put two would select source one. And also we want to ensure that our AV receiver is powered on. Maybe give it a small delay with this pause icon. We could wait, say, a second. And then we can send another command to that AV receiver to ensure that it's on its proper input that cable sat we were connected to. If I recall correctly, let's just look at our tree to ensure 
Yep, cable sat. That's where my matrix was connected. Very good. So this is how you can build your own shortcuts in here. And if you're not going to use them all, you don't have to. You can just make them invisible. Again, I recommend making things invisible because maybe down the line you want, you wish you had something here and you just don't, <laughs> you, you already deleted it. So you can just make it invisible. If they can't see it, they can't press it. Restore that to default. One final thing, if I look closer now that I've zoomed in, that New Jersey Devils logo is actually, if you guys can see it, it's behind the white lines on this. So it's a piece of cake though. To do that, I have a item called depth. I can just hit plus 100 and now it's at 200 and it really depends on what depth level these lines are at. They were at 102. Now I've moved this to 200. It's, of course, in front of that. Very good. So now we can save. And where are we? Let's bring this back here. There we go. Okay. And, uh, and the final step, now that we've edited our system, we've already compiled our project, Emulator, as you saw, kind of a little kludgy in the um, modular system, but very, very, very good in the custom programming. Now, all there is to do is upload this system. So you see all of the information is going up to the cloud, and there's information about, uh, well, there's a compiled file, for example, but there's all of the graphics, all of the IR, RS-232 or TCP IP libraries, all live in this file that is now successfully uploaded to the cloud. And on our iPad, we simply go to registration, iPad or Android device, registration and update project, so we can begin downloading to the cloud. We see the blue status bar there work its way from left to right. And it typically just takes a little bit, uh, little bit of time right there in the middle because that's where a lot of the graphics are. So we're going to give it a few moments here. But as you can see, for the most part, everything is very, very fast. You're able to upload projects and download projects much quicker than it would take in the uh, with the traditional method of loading projects to a, a touch screen. So it has now completed here on the iPad that we're using as our touch screen and the very first thing you want to take note of is when we press start you're going to see the link light on our master controller here uh, so we have our MC1000 on top of our multi-viewer MLV 4x2 and when we press start for the very first time you're going to see the link light it's going to blink maybe once or twice very very quickly information is communicated from our controllers to the, the master controllers they shake hands they say hey I'm an OK iOS device or I'm an OK controller to be working with you so we press start we saw that link light we see that custom graphic that we had programmed in our system there at the front and behind me you could actually see um, some monitors here in the key digital compass control training room and so you're not only going to see there on the large screen but also see here on the face of the iOS device or excuse me the face of our multi viewer you'll see the blue lights moving and we'll show you what what it looks like in the um, on the Onkyo as well. So we choose our activity. Remember we had uh, activities, zones, devices, activity. We'll choose the zone one we had here. And when we enter this multi-viewer, if we want it, we can enter its module page directly to switch from source one to source, from source two to source three three to four, and we see this seamless switching, which is really, really excellent, isn't it? Back to source one, or in fact, we can even now go, this is an OSD of our Onkyo um, streaming device, so that if I enter it, music stream here, we see right now, I have Pandora going, 
and I could enter that my channels are loading and we'll enter into salsa radio and if you could see on the Onkyo player here it's actually uh, queuing up some information as it is on our screen there and so while the Onkyo collects information we have our feedback on the face of our iPad that's also going to begin showing that information so we see even that bi-directionally working out just fine there so of course there's a lot more testing that you can do and run through and there's a lot of different programs and project types that you might want to program as well but these are the principles of the modular programming method